Hello everybody, you're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. This is the local radio show where we chat about the local art scene. We have a different guest on each week. We head over to the Rylight Zone to hear some fiction and or some poetry. We catch up with Twanglin' Jack Ford over in the Oak Shed for a weekly album review. We play local, unsigned, independent and, you know... Und- underground music so as always you can find us on facebook if you search for the art show on wickham sound you should be able to find us you can email me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk that's d-a-n-e dot c-o-b-a-i-n at wickhamsound.org.uk and i'm particularly keen to hear from poets performers musicians anybody with mp3s anybody with a story to share potential guests don't hesitate to get in touch. So this week we're going to be having a highlight show with some highlights from our previous guests. But before that we're going to head over to the Rylight Zone. And this is the latest instalment of formerly The Rise and Fall of a Social Network by myself, Dane Cobain. And uh, this is a, a, a novel about uh, a fictitious social networking site for the dead. We've been serialising it in recent weeks so if you miss an episode you can always catch up to that. It's also available as an ebook, an audio book and a print book on Amazon and other goods you know, book sites. So, formerly the rise and fall of a social network. Chapter 21. Two days later, Flick and I were alone in my bedroom. She was sitting on the room's only chair as we streamed Netflix from my machine. She'd been quiet all evening, barely breathing a word, but suddenly she spoke. God, I'd love to take this company down, she said. And I'd love to help you, I replied. But what's it to you? Don't... We both know that John and Peter are up to something. They killed Abby, I know it. They probably killed Kerry too. We need to do something. I sighed. It's funny you should mention it, I said. I have a plan, but I'll need your help. Dan, I'd like nothing better than to help you. What's the plan? I paused for a moment, deep in thought, before I answered. I'm not quite sure, I said, but I think it will develop over time. You're in the perfect place to help me out here, and I already have my diaries and the code that I've written. But it's not just that. There's something else going on here. I don't know what it is, but I intend to find out, and I want you to help me. Sure, I'll do anything. Peter's taken me into his confidence, I explained, and it looks like I'm about to get closer to the founders than ever before. Perhaps that'll help. Maybe I'll learn something we can use. I want you to keep your eyes and ears open. You know everything that goes on around here, so tell me everything you know. In particular, keep your eyes on the founders and keep a log of where they go and who they speak to. But keep it analog and don't let anyone else know about it. I don't even want you to tell me where it is, you understand? Gotcha, she said. I mean it, Flick. We've got to be careful, careful like you wouldn't believe. Trust no one, and don't computerise anything unless you have to. Who knows what tech they've got in place to track our movements. I wouldn't be surprised if the rooms are bugged. In future, we'd better meet elsewhere. Jesus, Dan, since when have you been so paranoid? Since I realised that everyone else in this building is out to get me, I said. In the end, to avoid suspicion, I alternated between writing in my journal, which was hidden in a secret place off campus, and updating my profile on Formly. I had no way of proving it, of course, but it made sense to assume that the two founders had the ability to access the site's database, to de-encrypt the data and to read it at their leisure. With Formly's founders, I always assumed the worst, and the fact that it was theoretically possible was enough to scare me into filling my profile with false information, just in case. But it was in my journal that I was totally honest, particularly now that I had a plan. If Flick and I were going to take down the founders, we'd need as much information as possible, and words really can be weapons. My journal was an important part of the plan, and so as much as it was a ball ache to write by hand when I can type 130 words per minute, it was also a necessity. The sad thing was, I loved Formally. It was like a child to me, and I was beginning to suspect that the site housed more of my code than anyone else's, even though John and Peter bootstrapped the damn thing from a bedroom. But times had changed, and new features demanded significant rewrites and whole new swathes of code. We'd also been forced to upgrade to a new database to keep the site secure and to make sure that it wouldn't collapse under its own weight. Of course, when all the variables changed and we needed someone to manually make all of the changes in the code, the job fell to the monkeys at the bottom of the ladder. We'd stopped taking on interns, but we did hire coders from Stanford University, who were graduating and who wanted to stay in the area at all costs, even if it meant taking the lowest salary that John and Peter could get away with paying them. That was what was going through my mind as I wrote in my journal. Not Flick's lips, but the faces of the people that the company had crushed along the way. I counted myself as one of them, although I wasn't sure why. I stood to make some serious money if the company went public, enough to retire on. So why did I want it to fail? Operation Nemesis, as Flick and I were calling it, was a slow burner. To protect ourselves if we ever got caught, 
We made sure that neither of us knew what the other was doing. I was given a little extra ammunition one evening when the office was virtually deserted. Flick was waiting for me to finish coding so we could kick back and watch Netflix, probably passed out on my bed. I, meanwhile, was trying my best to gather intel by working overtime. The only problem was that everyone else had given up and gone to bed, and I was still sat there trying to iron out a couple more bugs. I made it until 1 o'clock in the morning, and then I got up from my desk to make another cup of coffee. The source code was beginning to warp and meld in front of my minds, dancing across the screen, and I still had a couple of hours to go. The place was deserted when I snuck into the kitchen, but by the time I found some milk, there was the distant murmur of conversation in the air. I followed the sound towards the boardroom and then melted into the shadows as I got closer to the door and saw what was happening. I wasn't the only one with an interest in the conversation. It was Nate, the cleaner. He was trying to look as though he was cleaning the skirting board, but the sponge in his hand was bone dry and I watched him for a good 30 seconds. He wasn't cleaning. He was eavesdropping, and that meant I couldn't get any closer without being seen. i just decided to confront him when the door opened and the two founders stepped out. They didn't even look at Nate, who was back to cleaning the skirting boards with his dry sponge, and I had to back even further into the shadows to stop them from seeing me. It was a close call. As soon as I knew that the coast was clear, I stepped out into the hallway, just in time to grab Nate by the collar as he tried to beat a hasty retreat. He was the smaller man, and my momentum took the two of us crashing into the wall. His sunken eyes admitted defeat the second they clocked onto me, but that didn't stop him from trying to wriggle away. What the hell do you want? He panted. His pupils dilated as I tightened my grip and watched him squirm. He knew he was in trouble. There was an extra irony in the fact that if I attacked him, he'd have to call for the security team, who would hit him too if they found out what he was up to. I let him plead with me, though his words fell on deaf ears. When he repeated his question, I answered him in a word. Information. I don't understand, he replied. Then let me explain. It's simple, really. I want to know what you heard. Not just that, though. More. Everything else you've overheard, and everything you hear in the future. Yeah? Nate laughed. What's in it for me? Well, I said, for a start you might get to keep your teeth, and your job for that matter. Besides, I can pay you if you find out what I need to know. How much? he asked. I'll decide that based on what you tell me, I replied. And I'll need proof too. The more comprehensive the proof is, the greater your reward. He was silent for a couple of seconds whilst he thought about it. Then he realised he was out of options, and I watched as his eyes glazed over. Okay, he said. I'm in. Now let me down. I loosened my grip. Not too much, just enough to make sure that he could breathe. What's it to you, anyway? And how do I know you're going to come up with the goods if I help you? The first question is none of your business, I replied. And as for the second, you're going to have to trust me. And you'd better trust me quickly because I'm about the only friend you've got around here. You're not my friend, he scowled. No, I replied, I'm not, but I'm about to be. Better get ready to trust me, Nate, because you're going to tell me everything you know. That was the latest instalment of Formerly the Rise and Fall of a Social Network by myself, Dane Cobain. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound, and this is Kit Goff with Fire. Tell me now what I'm supposed to know At now the exit I'm at door All of my senses they were fading All of the things that I survey Watch now them all just fade away As now the world is always changing And I'm done As I would sit and contemplate Am I just a little late For all the things that I was dreaming
fonts and how you feed For success or failure is so sweet Compared to never even trying That was reminisced by John C. Buttigieg, and before that we had Kit Goff with Fire. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dan Cobain. And it's time now for us to get into the uh, highlights section of this week's show. So we're going to head over to some previous guests. This is part of our chat with publisher and author Stephen W. Booth. Uh, I wanted to know, and you mentioned this, or you kind of alluded to this, but who else is on the team with you at Genius? Um, at the moment, we, uh, there's myself and uh, my wife, Leah. She is our uh, chief organizing op- uh, officer. <laughs> we, we instead of chief or, uh, operating officer, she's our chief organizing officer and our editor in chief. Uh, and she she's also our submissions editor. So if anybody's submitting a book to us, uh, they, it goes through her. 
Um, we we were we did have a, a staff of one. Uh, her name was Sabrina Lee, and she, we had her for about a year. But then she moved to Madrid, Spain, to teach English to people in Madrid, mm-hmm. Spain, and so therefore we became just a two person operation again. So awesome. Cool. Um, and so I wondered if you could tell us about a few of the different authors that you work with. So who, you know, who are on your, your books, so to speak, some of the different okay. authors. Um, well, let's see. Uh, just to kind of give you an, an idea, um, the first guy we published beyond myself and Harry uh, is an author named David Dean. Um, and he's notable for not only being a, an ex-paratrooper and pol- chief of police of a small town in New Jersey, but he's also in Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine like every other month. Cool. Uh, which uh, I don't know if you if you have that in, in the UK, but it's um, it, it's basically short stories about true crime and or crime and stuff like that. It's mostly fiction. Yeah. Uh, and, um, it, you know, so we're, we're actually publishing several of his books now, including four collections. We just launched one of his collections a couple of weeks ago. Um, he's great. We had, um, for a while, we had, um, a, an author, uh, named uh, Dr. Al Carlisle. He was actually the, um, psychologist who was tasked with determining whether or not a, a young man named Ted Bundy was mm-hmm. violent after he got convicted of, uh, trying to kidnap uh, a woman named Carol DeRanche back in 1975. And it turns out that Ted Bundy was violent and they kept him in jail and so on. And now everybody knows that story. Yeah. Uh, we had his books until uh, from about 2013 until 2018 when he passed away and his books reverted back to his daughter, who's also a publisher, or she is now anyways. Um, who do we have? We have um, one of our favorite books right now is uh, by two authors, uh, Ralph Sutherland and Harold Cherick. Uh, they, uh, um, they were involved with the bootleg record industry back in in Los Angeles in 1969 through 1976 and they did um uh, they they knew the guy who actually was doing it who we call pig man because the the logo of the of trademark equality that's the book is about is the pig um and uh he's you know that that's a um one of our best selling books right now it's um this beautiful lush a4 sized uh you know uh, book on on the entire history of uh, bootleg records from the point of view of of trademark equality. Um, who else do we have right now? We have um, I'd have to look at my list. <laughs> we have uh, um, uh, we're just publishing a book by an, uh, one of the DJs at KNAC um, at Los Angeles FM, which is the first uh, one of the first heavy metal rock stations back in the eighties and nineties. It's his memoir or whatever we want to call it. It's just, that's coming out in a couple of months. Oh my! I have to look at my ca- mm-hmm. my my list. Oh, we have a book about um uh, fr- by an uh, author named Tony Reed, who is uh who is a a, a private investigator and and uh, um a, a, a appeals attorney who wrote a book about um Joseph D'Angelo, who's now known as the Golden State Killer. Although that's really not what he's called; that was just a brand name that somebody threw at him. Yeah. Uh, and uh, his book, uh, twelve twenty six uh seventy five is about how Joseph D'Angelo could have been caught in 1976 if they had just stopped protecting him, yeah. which is what they were doing. So we have we have a variety of books. Uh, I can go on. We have something like 40 titles. Yeah. And, uh, you know, th- those are just the scratching the surface. Yeah. And we, of course, we have you. Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. Coming soon, yeah. That was a highlight of our chat with author and publisher Stephen W. Booth. And here is what we chatted about with the two, well, the guy and the girl from Sepia Tone Collective. How long have you both been performing, both sort of individually and together? Um, I've been on the stage since I was two. It's a definite um, lifelong passion to perform. But um, singing was never really top of my list. In fact, I actively didn't seek out my uh, West End ideals because I thought I couldn't sing. So, um, yeah, it's a bit of a turnaround for me uh, to be a lead singer in a yeah. band now. It was a awesome. unique moment. It was. You, decided, you, you can say and we were in the shower at the time. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Cool. And so how, long, been, how long have you been playing together? A um, year, almost exactly a year. I think it was in August, uh, the end yeah, of August last year. Yeah, got about a month. Yeah, so 11 months we've been playing together. Yeah. Awesome. I've, I've just been playing music um, for years and years, just in, in bands. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. 
Awesome. And I wanted to ask you about some of the venues you perform at. Do you have any particular like favourite venues to play at? I think our, our, our go-to was the Garibaldi in Tableau, yeah. but unfortunately that one's not happening anymore. Um, we love playing at the Stag and Huntsman in Hambledon, don't we? Yeah, that's a really nice venue. Yeah, they often do kind of beer, cider, ale, hot dog, sausage, burger festivals. And, um, the, and it's always they're really South nice African, weather. so they do braise yeah. and yeah. Really and it's nice. always, it's never been bad weather there. It's always, they always seem to bring South African weather as well <laughs> and have this blazing hot sunshine. So awesome. yeah, they're really good weekends. Yeah. Cool. And obviously, well, we like I, oh, jumping sorry, into any and every venue, like we we just kind of go a bit on tour, don't we? Sometimes yeah. the more the merrier, kind of thing. Any venue that will have us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. And obviously, I met you guys uh, through like you performing at the Far Out sessions, and I wondered how did you first get involved with with Far Out sessions? Yeah. How did we? Uh, that was through the Gary Baldy, wasn't it? Well, that's you because you do all the social. Yeah. Media. <laughs> Uh, so I think that um, they were doing a fundraiser at um, the Gary Baldy and um, obviously we were doing lots of open mics and, and someone suggested that we went along. Uh, so we did, but we we hadn't been asked to play, but we bought our stuff just in case, yeah. you know, as you do. And um, and so we met Dean and Ali there and got talking and I think they kind of liked our vibe and then <clears throat> they kind of asked us to get up and play so we were, we were a little unrehearsed to say the least at that point but um yeah that was the first kind of time they had heard us play and I think that they from there went okay we want to we want to see more of them we, pl we played a nine minute cover of house of the rising sun yeah. and nice. Dean was either really bored or really enthused because he joined in yeah he grabbed his guitar and was like, I know this one, let me play. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> that was a highlight of our chat with the Sepia Tone Collective, a local folk act. And uh, this is part of the chat that we had with local artist Decatur. Well, one of the things I wanted to ask you about as well was um, the T-shirt design you worked on for uh, Wickham Art Centre. And I think that was related to, am I right in thinking that you have uh, ADD, is that right? So, yeah, ADHD, ADD, depending on what they're calling it these days, it's sort of changing quite a lot. Yeah. Um, I'm undiagnosed. I'm still seeking diagnosis. Um, yeah. I'm at the point where literally the other week I was debating paying for it outright and uh, yeah. going down that road because uh, as an adult, it's harder to uh, go through the sort of NHS channels. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of people do go private. Um, yeah, it's yeah, that, that T-shirt was a cool thing. Um, and that was kind of the point behind that T-shirt. I think it was just that it said, uh, this is but what do you get if someone with ADHD uh, designs a T-shirt yeah. with no answer there being the fact that if you saw the T-shirt, it's uh, you think it's cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, effectively, I suppose that comes down to a lot of me and as I talk about unfinished projects a lot, um, that does play into it a lot because I do chop and change what I'm doing so frequently that, you know, something I start today and be so excited about, and sometimes this happens in the day, the same day as yeah. well, uh, can easily be transferred over to something else that I get excited about. And that last thing gets left or missed, um, you know, put on the back burner. Um, yeah, it's pretty much uh, my life. That was part of our chat with local artist Decata. And here we are in conversation with musician and singer songwriter Mika England. And I want to actually ask you about both of those. Um, and so if we start with the marketing uh what's yeah. like what's your your background so as you say 40 years of marketing you've been an art director um you know what so where did you get your start and where, where did your career take you um i was really lucky uh i got a job um almost straight away after college from um an agency which doesn't exist now uh it's become several other things um but it was the one that did the smash martians uh courage best you know names that uh most uh 50 year old pluses will know uh hofmeister uh, follow the bear um oh it was an uh, amazing uh, place to start um so uh we never got any tv while i was there um the best we got was um uh, quaker oats porridge a steaming bowl of porridge and a fixed camera um with a guy blowing uh cigarette smoke into it to make it look like it was boiling <laughs> 
So uh, that wasn't very glamorous. And then, um, uh, but then uh, straight after that, uh, started uh, jo uh, joining other agencies, top 20 agencies. And uh, yeah, it sort of like racked up there to the point where um, we were turning out a lot of uh, award-winning work. And um, yeah, it was um, it was awesome. It was uh, it was a very very crazy different period to today. It wasn't very woke. <laughs> awesome. And uh, and obviously you mentioned uh, the, your trans as well. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about your your trans journey. Um, yeah, I was um, in Chicago. I was very um, working for a German company. Uh, very, very lonely. I had a lot of time and introspection for introspection. Um, and uh, I've always been uncomfortable, really uncomfortable um, with groups of men, mm. especially when they get into the back slapping. <laughs> yeah. And the, typical, the typical ad agency world as well. Yeah, Ab yeah. absolutely. Um so uh, yeah i was manifestly uncomfortable with that um and um yeah i just just uh, started if i if i thought about it, it because it was in chicago on the the oxford street of chicago so it wasn't exactly a place that you could uh, sort of slip out to, you know and sort of slowly start to um yeah but go, going out um I knew a lot of the uh, gay community from the uh, waiters and waitresses uh, who were serving there, and um, they they supported me um, uh, to uh, start the transformation. Yeah, so that was just progressive. By the time I came back to England uh, in uh, December 2018, I was uh, wearing women's clothes and presenting the whole time. Awesome, cool. And I wonder, do you think does being a trans woman affect your art and music at all? Um, well, it's interesting because I did a Myers-Briggs uh, test uh, years ago uh, mm -hmm. when I was presenting as a man, and that was uh, INTP. Mm -hmm. um, now I, I did it again. Uh, I've done it twice, and it came out INFP, which is rather than thinking, feeling. Feeling, yeah. So That's, that's the same type that my uh, my girlfriend is, actually. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Excellent. I'm, and I'm, I, I'm an INTJ, so I'm a thinker and a judger. I think that's interesting. And um, uh, the somebody, another musician actually asked me, uh, has your music thing changed? It's difficult to tell because I actually started writing uh, some of my more uh, punk numbers, like um, The Ugly Writ. Um, I actually started writing that when um, uh, I was transforming. So uh, it's difficult to say, mm. is, it different? is it different than it was? Well, I never really wrote music or, or sang or, or all the rest of it. That was another thing, actually, um, going out and singing in front of people as a trans woman yeah, and as a freshly cracked one. And I have to say, wow, um, I really didn't know how to. I mean, I'm not sure I do now, but I mean, then, it, you know, I look at pictures of that and go, Ooh, blimey, that was uh, yo, that was that, that was hard to look at. Um, so, um, you know, but it but it it got me out there and uh, taught me to confront people um, and not be um, maybe uh, sort of ultimately I, I had in mind, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll become a much more reclusive, retiring, shy, quiet, feminine sort of woman. And uh, that's not the way it's worked out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was part of our chat with musician and singer-songwriter Mika England, and here is part of the chat with uh, Deirdre Waite, who is a cover designer for Encircle Publications. So, um, what can you tell us about Encircle Publications? You, you sort of mentioned them uh, in passing there. What can you tell us about the company? Well, uh, it's it's <laughs> we're a band of rogue publishers. Um, we worked for a larger publisher for almost 20 years, and... Um, during the last administration, they instituted a tax break that allowed that company to send our work to India. So uh, we looked at each other and said, well, we can all go get jobs or we can go all in. So Encircle got its start, technically speaking, with uh, Eddie Vincent and his wife, Cynthia Brackett Vincent. They were publishing poetry, uh, the poetry journal, The Aurorium. And so um, they started with that. They started with chat books. And uh, as our former publisher closed their mystery line, we had those authors coming to us asking about, well, can Deirdre keep doing my covers because I want them to look the same. So what if, you know, you guys helped me self-publish? Yeah. 
we get enough of these queries that we start looking at each other saying, well, we know how to do this. Do we just start publishing fiction? And we're all book lovers. You know, I mean, I've, you know, read as long as I've, you know, been able to do anything. And it was encouraged strongly in my family. So, um, you know, I, I grew up like you reading Agatha Christie. Mm -hmm. um, that was my introduction to mystery and, and watching all the movies with my grandmother and everything. It was her book collection that I rated regularly. So, um, so that was in, well, I guess 2018 was when we started really putting books out for, for real. Um, but in 2019, when our major contract went away, we just decided to go all in and spend our time trying to put out as many good books as we could find. And, and, uh, it's been an extremely interesting ride because, you know, that ha it's happened all during the pandemic. Mm. So while I've seen other companies struggle to survive, you know, we've struggled to thrive, but we've managed to do it. So I, we've succeeded in in publishing. I don't know. I think we're up around 150 books in, you know, four or five years. So, <laughs> awesome. you know, and it's basically four of us. Uh, occasionally we get help from from, you know, the, the odd person here and there. But for the most part, it's four people doing everything we've got to do to try and get these books out there and you know, we have huge faith in, in the stuff we're putting out. You know, again, we're a big fan of you, Dan, Dane, and, and mm -hmm. all of your your um, books. I, you know, you probably can't see them behind <laughs> me, but they are about, uh, all the uh, Encircle awesome. books I have behind me. Cool. Um, my top shelf is this year's <laughs> output. Um, and so, um, yeah, so, and uh, again, I, I hear there's another uh, late fold. I, I'm, yeah. I'm afraid I don't say it right. Yeah, no, it's, it's funny what, with uh, all of the names in that series, I've, I've deliberately chosen names that are kind of weird. So I, I say Lightfold um, and like Lightfold. Miley. And then the, the big one is uh, Jack Chumley, the policeman. Uh, so Chumley is like an old English surname <laughs> that looks like it should be pronounced Cholmondeley. Um, and yeah, it's not for weird that, I was going to say, reasons. that's how I say it in my head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That was part of our chat with Deirdre Waite from Encircled Publications. You're listening to the Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dan Cobain, and this is the incredible Maz Manzini with You Should Have Jumped. You should have jumped.
Should have jumped by Maz Manzini. You're listening to the Arch Owl 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and it's time for us to go back to the highlights section of our show. And so, this is part of our chat with uh, local promoter Neil Brown. Cool, awesome. So, obviously, today I want to talk about the events that you've been hosting, um, and we're going to talk about the rebrand and whatnot as well. But so, you started out as uh, Books Lockdown Sessions, and I wondered if you could tell us. Kind of how that got started and what was you know behind your decision to start putting on putting on the lockdown sessions well so i mean i'd run events previously kind of to my local town in judge class when i well when i lived there um but over lockdown it's kind of i just missed going to gigs and things really and had a few friends that were musicians and i'd seen another show that had been on sort of right at the start of lockdown like um because ours started on the 11th of april so it was like before that even it was like mid-march yeah um and spoke to the guy who did it and he told me kind of how to set it up and stuff um and yeah so we did it for a couple of weeks it was supposed to be just a few weeks you know people i know that are musicians put doing it and then obviously lockdown continued yeah and everything you know um so yeah we we kept on going with it i ended up recruiting different people that some of them I met through, you know, buskers in London and different things like that. Um, others that I'd found online. I generally did it by listening to their live streams rather than listening to Spotify and things like that because I wanted to sort of, you know, see what they were like live. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the whole thing was mainly about, one, giving the musicians a sort of a platform to play when they didn't have any gigs. Um, but two, as well, just kind of trying to help people with regards to mental health and you know raise money but also raise awareness and kind of give some give people something to do really while you know when they couldn't go out that was part of our chat with local music promoter neil brown and here is part of the chat that we had with daryl paterson who is the store manager of hmv high wickham uh, and who's been working on the hmv live and local show and who are some of the artists that you've had in store i appreciate there's been a lot so i don't know a few been maybe. A, yeah so obviously your band the ilk of course um We've had all sorts. We've had such variety. It's been absolutely mad. So we've had Tony Goff and the Broken Colours. We've had Bolo Bolo. We've had Cortez and Jackson. Weekend just gone. We had a band from Reading called Third Lung who mm -hmm. released that album on Friday. Um, we've had some folk acts uh, such as my mate Dave and Luna Barge. Um, We've got, we've had Screaming Irene. So, yeah, it's I think it's probably about north of 60 acts of have played. Wow. So it's difficult to remember all off the top of my head. Um, but they've all been brilliant, to be fair, and such a variety. Yes, yeah, so we've had folk, we've had blues, we've had acoustic, we've had more rock, more indie kind of. Um, it's, it's mad the variety we've managed to find and uh, find a place for, really. Awesome, cool. And like, how important is it for for you and the team to to highlight the local music scene? Uh, yeah, it's massive. It's it's it's, it's effectively it's 
it, it does several things. One, it gives our customers something different. Um, so they come in and they're what's going on? Why is there music? It's <laughs> something they've not got used to seeing. It used to happen all the time, but these days not so much. Um, so that's important. It obviously gives bands an opportunity, but as much as anything, it gives us more of a connection with our local community, really, because that's something that was kind of lost over a long period of time. We're like when you become a, a when you're a big chain, you kind mm. of it's difficult to kind of stay in touch. And it's one thing when we were bought out in 2019, it's one thing the new owner wanted. He wanted us to be more in touch with the community, whether it be social media and live and local and these kinds of things. And kind of obviously we're still a chain and you'll walk into any H&V and there'll be similarities, but we should hopefully have slightly more of our own identity, personality mm. and a bit more flexibility. And like I said, the ability to interact yeah. and do things that are a bit different and entertain it, hopefully. And, and that's something I kind of wanted to ask you about was like how much autonomy you're given by head office. Um, but I guess you've kind of covered that to an extent. Um, but yeah, they're quite yeah. supportive of you doing your own thing. Yes, absolutely. And to be fair, they're quite good. If I, particularly when, if someone, obviously we're given the stock we're given. Um, yeah. So there, there's only so much you can do, but you can, they're also conscious that not every story is the same. So there's only so much, particularly for the, our biggest issue is the size of the store mm. and trying to fit everything in the find a home. So that we're given a guide of how everything is supposed to go, where it's supposed to go and what kinds of space, but you don't necessarily have all that stock at that right time. So it's kind of a trying to find what works best for you, fit everything in. So yeah, they're quite happy for you to be flexible as long as obviously you're making money as well. <laughs> um, if you're making yeah. loads of mad decisions and you're losing money hand over fist, then they'll probably uh, take a dim view, but they're quite good at, also, it's one of the things they've opened with all the new stores they're opening. They're giving them much more license to try things, and then the things they work, they will go, okay, other stores, do you want to have a look at this? Is this yeah. something you could incorporate and stuff like that? So yeah, they're they're very much. If you went back sort of five, six, seven years, it was very much a no. This is what your shop needs to look mm. like. That's not the case anymore. We're given much more freedom to. As, as much as anything, put the team's personality on the shop. That was part of our chat with Daryl Peterson from HMV. Uh, this is part of the conversation we had with author Tori T. And it's interesting because like that re, uh, coming in via fan fiction. I mean, that's how uh, that's how E.L. James wrote the Fifty Shades series, wasn't it? And I think yeah, a lot of writers have got into it either via that or through things like Wattpad as well. So it's kind of interesting that again, these new sites and these new communities are given like new routes for people to become writers. I think. Definitely. And there's um, there's quite a lot of Facebook groups now where there's very, um, very new authors. Some of them are only 13, 14 years old and they're posting mm. things in there for critique. And I just think it's so brave of them because at that age, I was doing it anonymously under a pen name yeah. on a, a fan fiction website, whereas they're putting completely original fiction out there with their own names attached and just having a go. And I, you know, hands up to them. They are brave. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Cool. Uh, and I've got to ask, uh, what's your take on, you know, the latest uh, controversies with J.K. Rowling? Are you, do, would you still consider yourself a Potterhead? Is it I think, uh, separating the art from the artist? Yeah, I think you can love the book and the world she created. And at, at the end, it, it got me through some really dark times. And it's still, when I'm having a bad day, it's still my kind of go-to universe to fall into. So I... I kind of, I never really pay attention. It's probably quite bad. I don't really pay attention to the person behind it. I know who, who writes it. Mm. Um, never really rated much of her adult stuff. That never did it for me. It was just the, the magic. And I think around Harry Potter was the hype. You, we're never going to see again yeah. millions of people camping outside bookstores to get a book because with the rise of digital, that, that's just never going to happen yeah. again, I don't think. So I like the... Um, I've I kind of got the nostalgia with it. I grew up with it. It's I love the universe, the, the films. I don't necessarily agree with what she says, um, but at the end of the day, I do fully support people having their own views, just perhaps mm -hmm. not using it, <laughs> a platform like hers to air them. You know, maybe yeah. she should have kept it a bit more under wraps. Yeah, cool, awesome. And so you mentioned your your book uh, came out two years ago in November. I've, I've got to ask, was it deliberate to do it in November to kind of reflect your start with uh, Nano Remo, or is that just a coincidence? No, it was um, that one, uh, Found by Drew, I had been writing. It was originally called Puddles of Love um, because I, I got the idea as I was writing in a new notebook. Um, so I called it um, Found by Drew 
in the end because that's what happens the, the character is found by a guy called drew um but i didn't do it deliberately but now you've pointed out that i wonder if there was like some subconscious universal thing going on there yeah yeah awesome i mean it's a good time to launch a book as well because obviously it's just before christmas as well and so kind of gives people you know it's the perfect uh, christmas present to sort of buy sort of unsigned books. That was a highlight of our chat with author Tori T. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is Sloth in the City with Santiago.
that was Santiago by Sloth in the City. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Ian Cobain, and we're going to head over to the Oak Shed now to catch up with Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review. Madness, the definitive singles collection. There seems to be lots of ska about at the moment. Lots of imaginatively named bands covering both two-tone and the original Jamaican ska greats. People look back on Two-Tone as a great multiracial revolution, but it was just The Specials, The Selector and Madness. The Specials had a few hits with some covers, and then a big hit with the groundbreaking Ghost Town, and then Split. The Selector only had one hit. But following the success of their self-penned Prince Buster tribute, Madness got signed to Stiff Records, where... If it ain't stiff, it ain't worth a you-know-what. Madness had a mission statement. You know what to art, let's dance. And Madness were off and running, one step beyond, on a night boat to Cairo. Their first stroke of genius was the song My Girl's Mad At Me, a kitchen sink soap opera in one act, a truth universally acknowledged by all the blokes down the pub. They covered Labby Sifri's It Must Be Love, making it their own. In those overdressed new romantic days of wobbly synths, orchestral stabs, rattling bass and chorusy flangy guitars, each new Madness single was a breath of fresh radio airtime. Witty observational lyrics. The kids are playing up downstairs. It's quicker if you run. All performed with a deadpan North London accent all dressed in black suits, in videos that looked like mini-episodes of Grange Hill but with flying saxophonists, all performed whilst doing their trademark jerky dance. Just well-produced pop music that gradually became less scar and became something totally their own, as they became the Lost Palmer Seven, driving in their car and claiming to be Michael Caine. I saw Madness in their heyday at a free concert in Brockwell Park, probably at their peak, just before a long split. Madness, the definitive singles collection. Big thank you to Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review. Thank you to all of the guests whose highlights I've shared. Thank you to all of the musicians whose music I've played. As always, you can catch up to catch up with me here. You can drop me an email on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. I'd love to hear from poets, performers, musicians, people with MP3s, arts, news and stories to share. You can also find us on Facebook. If you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. And we're repeating on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. We're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again, iTunes, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. So I'm going to leave you with one last tune now, courtesy of previous guest Robert Honor. This is Not A Cloud. I'll catch you next week. Thanks for listening.
different stations and rationalities through every season you'll always be with me the sun will rise and I realize the beauty in your Small cross that wind swept shore, but not a cloud in all the sky. Yes, we'll meet one small kiss like never before. We're not a cloud in all the sky.